Uh, hello to everyone who is out there. Um, my name is Jeremy, as Liam has said, uh, and I'm a, a neurosurgeon in Melbourne uh, with a particular interest in trigeminal neuralgia. So I'm going to give you an overview today. I'll touch on also a couple of related conditions, treatments, and at the end of the day, if you have any questions, please do not hesitate to contact. Uh, and similarly, I'm happy to uh, answer questions as we're going. Okay, let me... Okay. Okay. Has that swapped over? Great. So uh, as stated, trigeminal neurology overview, I'll be talking about who's a candidate for a microvascular decompression as well as the other procedures. What happens if it fails um, or why you may not be a candidate? And I'll briefly touch on glossopharyngeal and geniculate neurology, which are all in the same family. Okay. So the most recent classification for TN is from the ICHD uh, and it's recurrent unilateral. Having said that, it can be bilateral, maybe one or two percent of cases. And it's brief on and off, sudden onset, offset, typically electro electrical, sharp stabbing, severe pain. It's limited to the trigeminal distribution. So we have V1, that includes the eye, V2, the cheek, V3, the lower jaw. And it's triggered typically by things such as brushing your teeth, talking, chewing, eating, etc. There are various subtypes. The most recent is under primary or secondary. So primary classical is what was previously known as typical trigeminal neuralgia. And here it's the classification, as I've said. But when we do an MRI, you have to see evidence of an artery distorting the nerve. So the nerve has to be either bowed or distorted or anatomically abnormal, so atrophied, so shrunken. Idiopathic is the same classification, but where the MRI does not show the distortion uh, or atrophy, you can still just see an artery touching the nerve. And secondary is due to other things such as multiple sclerosis, tumors, AVMs, etc. So another cause. Now, within those, you either have purely paroxysmal, which is just the brief sudden electric shocks, or it can be, and this is a bit of a handful, concomitant continuous pain. So that used to be more type two in the old classification. So it means on and above the short electrical zaps, you have a fairly continuous background pain and that is more often a burning dull tingly kind of pain that have to be has to be present for more than 50 percent of your pain or account for more than 50 percent of your pain okay so <clears throat> there are a lot of masqueraders um i don't know the numbers but my guess will be of the people that i see in my rooms each year one third of the people that are referred to me for tn don't have tn um, there are the trigeminal autonomic cephalgias or TACs, uh, Sunctan Suna. Uh, I won't go into what they stand for, they're a bit of a handful, but they're, they're basically exactly the same kind of pain, uh, but they're associated with autonomic features. So it's the autonomic nervous system, and typically it's tearing of the eye, um, drooping of the eyelid, runny nose, uh, etc. I personally think it is the same disease and I treat it as such. Now it's classified differently, um, but I don't, if I see someone who I think has a TAC, I will still treat them as a TN in terms of medication offered and surgical treatments offered. Now that is not universal um, and they are different classifications, but that's my personal belief. Dental disease, uh, I'd say a quarter of people who have seen me have had some form of dental procedure done in the preceding six months. Now, is it horse or cart? Did one precipitate the other, et cetera? I don't know, but there is a certain correlation. Uh, herpes zoster, so shingles, uh, where you get often a rash. Typically, it's in the V1 distribution, otherwise V2 or 3 less commonly. Um, and you get more of a constant burning pain. It's called a dysesthesia. It's very different to trigeminal pain typically. Uh, post-trauma so either you know car accident assault 
but that can also be, again, dental procedures, but trauma to the nerve, I'm talking. TMJ pain, so temporary mandibular joint, which is here. It's associated with jaw movement. It's in a different location, or it's more located back around the, where the jaw connects to the skull base. Um, tends to be more of a, an achy pain, um, although frequently people have been treated for it. Uh, and, and in my opinion, it's quite a different pain. Sinusitis, so you have empty hollow or hollow places within here and here, and they can become inflamed <clears throat> and not drain the usual fluid. And that sinusitis, again, more a dull, achy pain in that distribution. Giant cell arteritis is a disease more so of the elderly, which is in, involves the small to medium arteries, and you get pain through the temporal region up through here, typically painful brushing your hair in this location and painful to touch. Quite a different pain again, but the concern for that is potential blindness, so we take that quite seriously. Migraines can present somewhat similarly. Tumors, more of a dull, throbbing headache, worse in the morning associated with nausea and vomiting. And then a typical facial pain is kind of the wastebasket term we have for when we don't know. So to give you an idea of how many different classifications, this is just one of the pages from the um, ICHD. So I won't go into it. Please don't try and read it, but it shows you how many different subclassifications there are. So trigeminal neuralgia is a diagnosis purely on history. The amount of times that people come in and go, oh, my MRI says that I've got trigeminal neuralgia. No, 100% wrong. It is purely based upon the history you give the doctor. And that's why it's so important to take a careful and accurate history in this condition. The imaging does not make the diagnosis. There is no blood test. There is no test, period. It is purely based on history. The exam should be normal. Having said that, it's quite common to see very mild increased or even decreased sensation in the affected region. What I'm looking for more are other cranial nerve abnormalities, so surrounding nerve problems that may herald a tumour, for example. Um, or if there's significant numbness, <clears throat> then maybe there is an inherent issue with the nerve itself. Uh, I get an MRI on everyone, and this is not to confirm the diagnosis, but this is to exclude other diagnoses such as tumour or multiple sclerosis. We do, however, ask for very specific sequences, uh, looking for typically arteries. I'm not a big believer that veins cause this, but again, that is contentious. Um, looking for an artery hitting the nerve. Typically, it's the superior cerebellar artery. Uh, can be the one below called the uh, anterior inferior cerebellar artery. Um, and beware, at least in a third of cases, they are incorrectly reported. So just because the report says there is or is not neurovascular conflict, um, I would take that with a grain of salt. And that's important because with the new classification, not infrequently, this, tr this condition first presents to a neurologist rather than a surgeon. And due to the way it's been classified as to typical or idiopathic, there is some literature to state that if it's idiopathic, then surgery has no role. And I strongly disagree with that. Uh, and what I have seen on a handful of occasions now is that someone's seen a neurologist, the report has said there is no evidence in neurovascular conflict. It's been wrong. And the neurologist has said, no point seeing a surgeon, waste of time. And then they've subsequently seen me and I've pointed out where the problem was and successfully treated the condition. So just beware. Here is an example. Um, can you see my mouse pointer? Great, okay. So this is the right side, left side, trigeminal nerve. And on the left, <clears throat> you can see how it's fairly straight on the right. The nerve has been bowed down. That's why you don't see the whole thing. But this loop here is an artery. And that's in the typical spot in what we call the axilla of the nerve. So that's a very classic finding. And you can see it here as well. Okay, so medical treatment, I won't really go into this more to say that there is a host of various medications. Uh, in my opinion, carbamazepine or Tegretol, as some of you may know it, is the first one to try and it is the, the, the best medication for this condition in those that tolerate it. Um, it can cause some problems with lowering your sodium levels. So it's a salt in your blood. 
uh, and also affecting your liver function and other things. All of them tend to make you a little bit lethargic, can affect your balance, uh, et cetera. <clears throat> but in my opinion, that should be the first medication tried if there's no contraindication to it. And then there's a list of various others I won't go through. Uh, I will mention, however, that vitamin B12 and specifically methylcobalamin, which is here, um, is worth trying. It is integral for nerve repair. And it's a thousand units daily. You don't need injections. It's just a, a medication you get from your pharmacist without a script. For severe exacerbations where you're admitted to hospital, there are intravenous uh, solutions. So lignocaine, which is a local anesthetic, phenytoin, or if for the intravenous, it's fosphenytoin and ketamine. And there are others, but they're, they're the typical ones tried. And that's really if you're an extremist. So non medical management. Um, this is appropriate when either A, the pain cannot be controlled with medication, or it can be, but the side effects of the medication are intolerable. Generally speaking, if you fail to control things on two medications, the addition of a third agent has about a 1% chance of being helpful <clears throat> and a very high percentage chance of being problematic and further side effects. So. I would caution you if you've failed to and someone keeps pressing on with multiple further medications in addition, highly unlikely to be helpful. Uh, so in terms of medical therapy, there is a MVD or microvascular decompression, which is where we come in through the back of the head behind the ear here on the relevant side and remove the artery from the nerve. There are then percutaneous options. Uh, of which there are three. So they all involve a needle that goes in through the face about there, angled up through the base of the skull, through where the third component of the nerve exits the base of the skull. And either you inject a chemical called glycerol, you can blow, uh, which just chemically uh, damages the nerve. You can blow up a balloon, which mechanically crushes the nerve, or you can heat up the nerve with radio frequency, which cooks the nerve. Ultimately, they all work via damaging the nerve. They are all effectively the same procedure. There are nuances to them, but I kind of view them as essentially the same basket of procedures. Nerve blocks, not much of a part to play, to be honest. Uh, and then radiation therapy. <clears throat> um, now, percutaneous nerve and radiotherapy all work by damaging the nerve. So I tell people that you're effectively training pain for numbness. It doesn't always occur, but you have to expect to wake up with numbness and be prepared to have it for the remainder of your life. MVD is the only procedure that is nerve sparing. It is incredibly rare unless I go in and damage the nerve intentionally when I'm there. And we'll talk about that later. Uh, it is very rare to have facial numbness following this procedure. Okay, so for an MVD, so basically if you are fit, so... If you have trigeminal neuralgia, I agree upon that, and you've failed medication or the side effects are intolerable, then I will talk to you about an MVD. I much prefer to see an artery hitting the nerve because I think the outcomes are better. I will quote someone a greater than 95% chance of waking up pain-free if I see that and it all fits. If there is nothing seen, it doesn't mean that you won't find something when you're there but the likelihood is lower and the likelihood of the pain coming back is higher. Um, I am not particularly ageist with this procedure. In fact, there's very good literature to indicate that it is well tolerated in the more elderly subset of uh, the population, so 70s and 80s. Um, I generally will not offer it to someone with multiple sclerosis. Having said that, if there is no evidence of a plaque, so an MS plaque within the pons, which is where the nerve comes out, and there is clear evidence of a nerve, an artery distorting the nerve, I, I will discuss an MVD and it can work. Um, <clears throat> it doesn't work as well for type 2 or the concomitant continuous pain, as we'll call it now. Uh, you know, what procedures have been done before? Are you on blood thinners? And obviously patient preference. But in general... I think it is the first line of defense. Um, and then you consider other approaches if an MVD is not appropriate. Okay. Um, 
So I won't go through this in too much detail, but if you've ever had a history of cold sores, it can reactivate when you do this operation. So I would recommend taking an antiviral, so it's valaciclovir, beforehand to try and prevent it from reactivating, it still may. We use computer navigation to locate our entry spot to the, the skull. Uh, and then, as I said, go in and remove an artery, maybe a vein, but I am not really convinced that veins cause this. Uh, two to three hours, I'm probably not I'm more, not including the anesthetic now, an hour and a half. Uh, it shouldn't take that long unless it's a redo or there's some confounding issue. Uh, I put I take everyone to a, either an ICU or an HDU, so a high level acuity bed for the first night. I operate on a Wednesday. Most people are home on Sunday or Saturday. Risks, uh, I'm not going to run through all that, but it, <clears throat> uh, it is a pretty safe operation these days, or it should be. Um, touch wood, I haven't had any major complications. I've had no deaths and no, no paralysis or major cranial nerve deficits. Uh, really, the only main ones I've had has been temporary double vision, which is all resolved by six weeks. Oop. It's not. What are you seeing now? Sorry. Are you seeing a picture of? Oh, here we are. Okay. So this is an intraoperative view from the right-hand side. So that's the trigeminal nerve there. This structure you can see here is an artery. And that's looping down under the nerve and then back up like so. So that's what you want to see when you go in because you know the pa well, you're pretty certain the patient will have a good result. And this is after surgery, that artery I've moved up here. So it's well located away. Now, when you look at the nerve, once the artery has been removed, see how it's scalloped? That's an indicator that there has been damage to the nerve and some demyelination. So it's not a normal, healthy looking nerve. And also the colour of the nerve here is abnormal. Another sign that you want to see when you're there. Okay, so what happens on the MRI if I think you've got classic or idiopathic trigeminal neuralgia, we should call it now, but there's no evidence of vessel. I, I have said 50%, I would say a bit less now, maybe 30 to 40% of cases. When you go in there, you still find something because MRIs are good, but they're a static image. They don't show things as they move. So traditionally, if you went in and you found nothing, you would do what's called a neurosurgical kiss, which is the, there is a, a pair of forceps that we use called a bipolar, and you just give the nerve a bit of a squeeze. And it was a very gentle way of damaging the nerve. Now, in, in people that I've discussed this with beforehand, so if I don't see anything on the MRI before the procedure and we decide to go ahead with an MVD, I will talk to you about what you want me to do when I'm there. And there is this thing called a, a lay term of nerve combing or an internal urolysis where I divide the main nerve up into its individual components uh, to some degree, <clears throat> and that can work very well. It is a fairly new uh, procedure, um, not necessarily uh, taken on board by everyone, uh, and there is very limited data on it in the literature. Uh, there is a high level of facial numbness because you are roughing the nerve up. I have modified how I do it now and that has reduced, but still, again, you have to think that there is a very high chance of having some numbness. Um, I'll show you my data shortly. It works in about three quarters of cases, at least at the one year mark. And I think compared to the traditional neurosurgical kiss, it seems to have better results. Uh, Sorry, I'm not progressing my slides. Are you seeing anything change at your end? No, we just done the procedure slides still, Jeremy. Oh, no, okay. sorry, just... uh, now if I click on it. Okay, so this is my data um, in terms of the internal neurolysis or the nerve combing, I've done 14 of them. BNI is the Barrow Neurological Institute. It's the most common grading methodology. So one is no pain at all, no medication. Two is a little bit of pain, but no medication, typically not phased. Uh, 3A is no pain uh, on medication. 3B is a bit of pain on medication. Four is quite significant pain with medication. Five is intolerable, intractable pain. So they're my results. So effectively you can group 
one to three B as either no pain at all or pretty well controlled, and the, the latter two as unacceptable. So at the one year mark, they're my results. So around seven out of 10 people have done well at one year. Um, and then in terms of facial numbness, so it's the BNI, Baron Neurological Institute, facial numbness score. Now it's a pretty simple grading system you can see there. So one is no numbness at all. Two is mild numbness, which is evidently not bothersome. I don't know how you actually define that. Uh, three is somewhat bothersome and four is very bothersome. Um, so initially the two fours I had were, I think in my first four or five cases. And as I've modified it a bit, I haven't had any further really bad ones. But again, about seven out of 10 people actually they had no facial numbness or very mild facial numbness. Uh, often they wake up with worse facial numbness in the ensuing three to six months it reduces. So for both of them, how well it works and the degree of facial numbness around seven out of 10. But I, I do warn that this is one year data. I don't have long-term data, so I don't know what that'll look like. Okay, so in terms of, this is a procedure where I'd gone in, someone had already operated, so hence why this nerve is so red, I've removed the Teflon away. There was no evidence of an artery. And then I divided up the nerve. And here you can see this is the base of the nerve. So this is a more zoomed in view. You can see how there's a fascicle here, here, here. So it's just dividing them up. Okay. What happens if you've had an MVD and the pain recurs? Um, so I'd like to know at this point, is it still typical trigeminal neuralgia? Has the pain changed? How long did, well, first, was there evidence of neurovascular conflict at the sentinel operation? And if so, how successful was that operation? Um, who was the surgeon? I'd like to see the operation report and know exactly what happened. Um, I initially did this in COVID times. I have seen a few people that either COVID vaccination or infection flared up their symptoms. Okay, so in all these cases, after taking history, uh, repeat the MRI, looking for evidence of neurovascular conflict. Uh, I won't go into that in too much more detail. And obviously still like before looking for other things because they can still subsequently occur. So once more, the options are really the, the same. You still have medication, you have surgical options in SRS. Uh, my paradigm is that if I see clear evidence of neurovascular conflict ongoing, despite prior surgery, despite Teflon, et cetera, I will, as a first line, offer a redo MVD. Um, <clears throat> if there is no obvious cause, I'm pretty reticent to offer a redo MVD because the risks are slightly higher with a redo, not significantly, but they are. And then uh, I have talk to one person about going in to do the new, the nerve combing procedure, but more typically I would do the percutaneous approach or potentially stereotactic radiosurgery. Uh, so in terms of the percutaneous approaches, um, I do glycerol and balloon. I do not do radiofrequency, so I have to acknowledge that I am thus a little biased. Uh, Glycerol is kind of my first go-to because I have found that it gives less facial numbness than the others. Having said that, it doesn't work particularly one for v, particularly well for V1 pain. So I generally don't offer it to people with V1 pain, only V2 and or 3. It is repeatable. It is less durable. So typically the degree of facial numbness you get from this is a reasonably good prognostic tool for how long you'll get pain freedom. Now, it doesn't always hold. The balloon typically gives you more facial numbers, typically lasts for longer. Most people get used to the facial numbers. Take it maybe three to six months and, and you kind of, it's your new normal. Um, certainly at the start, you can get a bit of drooling. Your speech can sound a bit funny. You look normal. Okay, everyone asks that. Will I look normal? That's a different nerve. That's the seventh nerve. Um, <clears throat> but you'll get used to it. There are a few more side effects, in my opinion, with the balloon. It is a bigger needle. There is a slightly bigger risk of damaging the carotid artery, which is nearby, and that's probably the most feared risk of any of these procedures. Uh, touch wood, I haven't had it happen. There is a bit more in terms of rare double vision with balloon because the nerves that control your eyeball movements are adjacent to where the balloon blows up. 
Uh, the trigeminal nerve also carries the chewing fibers, so you can get a bit of chewing weakness with that. Um, the RFA is directable to where your pain is, so you can direct it to V1, 2, or 3. Uh, it is a bit more of a fiddle. You, you generally have to have the patient asleep, then wake them up, then put them back to sleep. Um, there are There's certainly one person that I know of in Melbourne, Nick Hall, does RF. Uh, I'm unaware of others that so there may be. And stereotactic radio surgery uh, is the least invasive. It's fantastic for people on blood thinners or elderly who can't come off them and don't want any invasive procedures. It works, all these work around 75% of the cases. Um, it can have a delayed efficacy, the stereotactic radio surgery. Having said that, I've seen a few people that it's worked immediately within the first day or two. Um, it doesn't tend to last very long. So I generally tell people maybe a year, year and a half if you're lucky. Generally, it's not repeatable. But none of them preclude the other one happening. So if you've had percutaneous, you can have SRS. If you've had SRS, you can do percutaneous, et cetera. Once you've done percutaneous, though, the MVD tends to be a little less successful if you go in that direction. Um, I tend to you uh, save these more for the more morbid person who won't tolerate a longer, a more significant general anaesthetic. I do my glycerol and balloons under general. You don't have to, but I think it's kinder. Uh, I think it's better for MS or more type 2 trigeminal neuralgia. Um, you have to cease anticoagulation for these. I'll do it on aspirin alone, but nothing more. Um, for the interest of time, I might skip that. So efficacy, this was, um, it depends on how successful they are. So interoperatively, I inject a dye to confirm them in the correct location. If you get a really good cisternogram, it's called, then it's more likely to be in the right spot and work properly. Um, this was the literature I had from a few years ago, a talk I gave. I think 84 is probably too high, to be honest. I would have said more like 64 to 90 is reasonable. It has a high recurrence rate. It is repeatable. Uh, generally speaking, patients will notice some numbness pretty quickly. It can take a week, maybe two weeks to work. And that's true of the balloon as well. Balloon tends to work faster because I think it's a bit more traumatic. I can't talk to you about RF so much. I think that's pretty instantaneous, but I haven't got personal experience. The stereotactic radiosurgery may take several weeks to several months or even six months is the longest I've heard for it to actually work. I personally think it's six months. It's just the disease went away rather than the treatment worked. Uh, so where we place the needle is at this point three, again, in the interest of time, I want, this is the patient that I've marked out. Uh, that is where the needle goes. So inside the jaw and up through the hole in the base of the skull, you can see here, that's an x-ray. So I use computer navigation in combination with x-ray and here you can see the needle going in. Well, there's the eye socket, base of the skull, upper teeth, lower teeth, needle. And then that's what you wanna see, a perfect filling of what's called Meckel's cave. Uh, so SRS can be gamma knife, can be cyber knife, doesn't matter. Uh, there's more literature on gamma knife. I don't think it matters. It depends on the person doing it rather than the machine. Like most things, it is completely non-invasive. Nowadays with cyber knife, you don't even have to have a mask fitted. It will track you as you move. You lie down on the couch. It will deliver the radiation. You get up, you go out for dinner. Sometimes it can be repeated. As I said, I, I tend to refer people who either cannot tolerate, have to remain on blood thinners, in which case that's perfectly fine, more elderly patients who are a bit frail from a general anaesthetic standpoint, or patient preference if they really don't want an invasive procedure, and, and that's perfectly reasonable. This is a planning using a gamma knife, this one. There's the nerve, and this is the contours that you see with the degree of radiation. It is a pretty high dose of radiation around, I think, 80 to 90 gray, typically. Um, that's generally, you'd say, three times more than you, or two to three times more than we'll give most brain tumors, for example. Now, Liam, do we have time to quickly run over the glossopharyngeal and geniculate? Yes, yes, we do. Okay. Um, so uh, these are relative cousins of trigeminal neuralgia, so that's the fifth cranial nerve. Glossopharyngeal is the ninth cranial nerve, and it's the same quality of pain, sharp, 
stabbing, severe, electric, but it's in the back of your throat. throat. So just behind your tongue. Uh, it tends to be unilateral. It's triggered mostly by swallowing. So the things to the glossopharyngeal nerve also supply some sensation to the back of your throat and the back of the tongue. Um, so it's triggered by the sensory component of that nerve. Uh, so swallowing, coughing, talking to a degree, not quite as much, yawning certainly can, and it's pain as described. You can also get some pain in the ear because there is a tiny bit of innovation to the outside ear from the glossopharyngeal nerve. Um, now, when you get the pain, it is not unusual for people to cough or have a transiently hoarse voice. And I've seen this one a couple of times and it can lead to quite diagnostic quandary. People with unexplained bradycardias or syncopal episodes, by syncope, I mean losing consciousness. So this can trigger your bradycardia as a slowing of the heart rate. And when you get this severe pain, it triggers a vagal response, which stimulates your heart to beat less frequently. And if it's severe enough for your heart not to beat at all, so you can transiently lower your blood pressure sufficiently to the brain so that you black out. It is reasonably responsible or responsive, sorry, to carbamazepine. So I still would try that with people, but it doesn't tend to work as well as TN. The other medications are generally less responsive. I, I would try one if carbamazepine fails, but I, I wouldn't go through the whole gamut of medications. I, I think that's generally a waste of time. Uh, there is only really the MVD for this. There's no accepted percutaneous procedures to the best of my knowledge and stereotactic radiosurgery. I've never heard of it being done either. I'm sure someone has tried it. So here, and then it's on the right, and this is the, the ninth of glossopharyngeal nerve, and that's the artery. So it's the same concept as TN. And this is the finding. So that's the ninth nerve. Then the 10th nerve, that's the 910 complex. And it's not actually this artery, but can you see this white part here? There's a small branch or a baby artery coming off this one that's distorting that nerve out. And then you remove that like you do for trigeminal neuralgia. Geniculate neuralgia comes off the 7-8 nerve complex and it gives you pain deep in the ear. So imagine someone getting an ice pick and shoving it in your ear hole. Uh, kind of like that. So that's, again, the same quality, sharp, severe, stabbing, electric, really piercing, nasty pain. If it settles with Panadol, it's not one of these neurologists. Um, within that region and coming from as a component of the 7-8 complex or the 7th called, called the nervous intermedius, which is involved with taste, um, and that there is a small sensory supply to, again, the ear, which is why you feel, perceive the pain there. It's really hard to diagnose. I think I've been convinced, properly convinced, maybe once. And a couple of times, I'm sort of like, yeah, maybe it is. Um, I've only done an operation on someone once purely for geniculate neuralgia. I think I've only done three. It's very, very rare. The others have been in conjunction with trigeminal neuralgia. So I said, when I'm there, it's literally five millimeters away from where you're operating or looking for trigeminal neuralgia. I'll have a look at, for an artery in the same thing. So I said, pain mainly in the ear. It can be just behind the ear as well. Sometimes in the back of the throat. I haven't personally seen that. Um, can be associated with a lot of sal salivation because that's your taste nerve, the nerve that supplies the salivary glands. Uh, lacrimation, I personally haven't seen that. Um, can respond to carbamazepine? Not really from what I've seen, but I, I would always give it a try. And again, there are no really percutaneous options. It's the same kind of concept that's an artery hitting the nerve. Now, I don't know how well this really projects, but that's your cochlea. These are the balance organs. So there's seven, eight nerve complex runs in here. And there is a loop. This is a different artery. It's typically the aica anterior inferior cerebellar artery and a little loop that runs between seven and eight. Often, though... No, I've turned it down because it's too loud. Um, don't know who that is. Uh, so often there will always... The aica gives off a branch to your cochlea. It's called the labyrinthine artery. 
tiny little thing, less than half a millimeter in diameter. If you lose blood supply to that, death instantaneously. So it is harder to treat surgically with a significantly higher risk of deafness. Uh, and because that tethers the artery, it is, you can't fully displace it away from the nerve, rarely. Um, so it's more padding the nerve away from the artery. Uh, but in, I think in the three cases I've done, two have been successful, one didn't seem to make a difference. And here's a finding again. So this is the 7 8 complex seen from behind, vessel, um, and it's actually that's a vein, that's the artery, and then managed to get that out away. And I think that is all. <laughs>